town square, and already it was operating at a scale where you thought, fucking town do you live in? Do you know, <laughs> you know that's a big town square, dude. You know, so it really, that analogy doesn't really fit. For Tanya Boucher, Facebook, in effect, produces space and time. We now run on time signals which correspond to social media. Our relationship to other things is mediated by these platforms. But she's specific, Facebook is the big one. It's the one that most people use, most people have a presence on. So our relationship to others is in that sense. And how we sit in relation to other things is through this platform and this, set of this company. And because of that, it means it's incredibly important. Alice, we can say. So, uh, can we say, in other words, that it establishes our ecological balance? That's a very, very nice way of putting it. And it's a really interesting way to put it. I think if you think of, and a lot of theorists have done this in the past, in particular James Lovelock, if you think of um, the world as an ecosystem in, as, in its entirety, this is a mediator in that ecosystem. In fact, it goes beyond mediator because it has, if you like, displaced a previous ecosystem and supplanted it with a new one. We now, <sighs> ecosystem is a really interesting word to use because what does an ecosystem do? It shows us how different organisms in a, in a place stand in relation to one another. And what Facebook does, according to Tanya Boucher, is it organises us in particular ways to stand in relationship with other people. You've heard me say a few times about the algorithms that play on your feeds on um, Instagram, but you don't always see all the things that you might want to see. That is that organisation principle going on. Facebook as a company, or meta I should say now, is using algorithmic profiling and algorithmic technology to place you in relation to things that it believes will maximise your value. You see me on Instagram being important. Let's assume that Diana followed me on Instagram and I followed Diana, we don't. But let's assume that was the case. It's not important that you see me. That's not where value lies. You see me as just like, oh God, it's a dick, right? But you're not going to buy anything because of that. Instead, you are organised in a particular way to see things which will suit that model. Yeah? So when we say we stand in relation to things, it is, you know, how does this organisation order us in particular ways to see the world? Now, the net effect of that is that we see the world in a particular way. If we're constantly seeing the world through this lens of Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, we are seeing it through a construction. You know, this is the principle of what we call mediation in action. What is important to note is that Facebook is a multiple entity. It doesn't mean one thing. And we stand in relation to it in multiple ways. And this is where I don't get the argument of it's not important because not engaging with it is standing in relation to this global object in a particular way. You are still engaging with it even when you're not because that position they know, they measure, they understand and they can still use that information in terms of profiling and targeting. You are still in it even though you're out of it. Anyone ever heard of uh, a guy called Ted Kaczynski? No one ever heard of Ted Kaczynski? The name familiar? Do you know where you've heard that name? Don't know. Is he in that? Yes. Do you know what his other name is? Ted Kaczynski is uh, better known as the Unabomber. Ted Kaczynski was a maths professor in an American university in the 1960s who believed that society was gone, finished. So he retreated from his job and from life in general. He lived in a cabin in the woods. And once every few years, he would go to a university campus somewhere in the United States, set a bomb, and kill people. That was Ted Kaczynski. Kaczynski believed that he had the answers because he stood outside of technology. 
he deliberately chose a lifestyle which meant he didn't engage with technology. You know, he was out in the woods, cutting his own wood, no television, no radio, no electricity, anything like that, off the grid, etc. Kaczynski was wrong because he defined his entire life by technology. Do you see the irony of that? His choices of life were purely dictated by the existence of technology. He wasn't existing outside of it. He was still in it. You know, he, his acknowledgement that it was everywhere and all around meant he was still in the system. He was just choosing not to engage with it. That's all. There's a big difference. He didn't exist outside of anything. It's the same if we choose not to use Facebook. You're still existing in Facebook's world. You choose, you're making a choice on how much you engage with that service. That's all. But the, you know, my, this is my mother's thing, like, you know, she's, my mother won't go on Facebook. She's like, no, don't want them knowing where I am. So, they already fucking know where you are. <laughs> you, you were way beyond, they were way, way beyond that. They already know. And then she's like, oh, will you look up this person on Facebook for me? They put photos up about this wedding. Get the fuck, just get your own account, all right? I'm looking up some random, you know. Um, so, it's impossible to get outside. For Tania, Facebook is a discursive concept. It's a basic concept in our language and has specific meanings. And it has discursive power as well. Now, that idea of discursive power comes from Stuart Hall. What Hall says about discourse is that discourse organises the way that we can speak about a topic. So when discourses work in society, they organise what can and can't be said about a particular topic. Facebook acts, therefore, as a discourse. It organises ways that things can and can't be said. And these have really profound implications. When Facebook says that it's okay for people to talk about the 2020 American election being stolen from Donald Trump on its service, it allows that to become a commonly accepted way of doing it. Facebook could decide, no, you cannot propagate lies about the 2020 uh, American election on our service. Facebook could say, you are not allowed to be a COVID denier. It could say, you are not allowed to share information about Holocaust denial on our service. It, it's within its power to do any of those things. It chooses not to. Because of that, it allows discourses about these contentious issues to develop. So it has what we call discursive power. It shapes what can and can't be said in society. Facebook has, at times, said, no, you can't do that. You cannot say this. You will be banned for this. It has tried to shape the narrative. It's an example that I've used before, but if you want to know about the discursive power of Facebook, think about how it treats women and breastfeeding. Facebook won't allow those pictures. All right? That is creating a way of society itself to talk about that thing, which has got to be just right up there as one of the most natural things that there possibly is. But Facebook is allowing a discourse to do it because it says, no, you can't share that on our service, which billions of people use. And so, well, that must mean that it's this. Yeah? It creates an issue then with this action, which is like, well, fuck yeah, <laughs> breastfeeding, I can't really think of anything that's like, you know, more fundamental, you know. So, it has discursive power. Let's take five minutes there, okay, because we've been going an hour, and I'm so tired. I agree. Or we're being tired. <laughs> I'm glad there's a consensus. I do mean five minutes, back at five past two. I will go.
that it is an infrastructure. You might be asking the question at this point in time, how is this relevant to what I've asked you to do in this module? All of these indicators here can be applied outside of Facebook. So if you're looking at Instagram, obviously you can see the direct link, but even if you're looking at a different platform, then that's fine as well. 
these ideas about how Facebook operates in the world are also important when we consider all other social networks. So, as an infrastructure, what Tanya Bucher is doing is indicating that Facebook is a bit like the roads. You, the society, and I've raised this point with, in seminars, I think, but, um, or maybe it was in the lecture last week. See, my brain is not what it used to be, unfortunately. This happens to you when you get in your 40s. Um, you can't get rid of the roads. Much as we would like that, if, we, if we're that way inclined, we can't do it. Okay, society itself is massively contingent on the existence of this infrastructure. It is an infrastructural system that moves things around, moves us around, allows us to be mobile. Our entire economy is built on the idea that we can move things around. For Bucher, Facebook is an infrastructure. We can't get rid of it. If we did get rid of it, we need something to do exactly the same thing as it. There would have to be like a Facebook 2 to come along and do the same thing. It's ubiquitous, it's widely shared, and when she says it's built upon, just like the infrastructure in our physical world is built upon, you know, you build a road and you build factories next to the road because you need access to the road for your goods to get out. We build things upon the Facebook infrastructure. A lot of you guys will be in the future involved in digital marketing and so on. You will come to learn this. You will be building stuff on this platform. You will be using its insights to craft what you do as a professional. And then you will be making things to go directly onto that platform. So we actually build on it. Like all infrastructure, it is embedded in the world in a particular way. And it therefore becomes really essential to how the world works. So it enables movements of capital, of matter and so on. And therefore it creates and invents as well. So, as an infrastructure, it's an essential part of everyday life. For something that didn't exist 20 years ago, that's pretty impressive. It's only 19 years old now. So to become a fundamental part of global infrastructure in that way, whoa, the internet took a lot longer than that. So Facebook's role is really, really huge. As Anne has said in a lot of work, Anne Helmand, um, Facebook, and this is the point I was making right at the beginning of the lecture, right? Facebook is a beyond Facebook. That site itself is a tiny part of what Facebook means. So the like button goes across the web. So every part of the web itself is integrated with Facebook in some way. Not only is the like button everywhere, but Facebook's tracking cookies are everywhere too. They exist all across the web, tracking your movements as you move from site to site, service to service, platform to platform. They are everywhere and you know they are also nowhere because you don't even know about it. You don't see them. So, the platform extends beyond the platform itself way, way beyond. And that's how they get you even when you're not in it. Facebook as a platform exists way beyond its core services. Whole divisions of it are dedicated to making sure it can rake in as much information outside of its core platforms as it does inside its core platforms. So fundamentally, it is everywhere. This guy is a really important guy, Tim Berners-Lee. Does anyone know what Tim Berners-Lee did? Tim Berners-Lee did. Have you ever watched QI, the television program? Oh, you know, are you going to do like the... Yeah. Um, when you get an answer wrong on QI, answer. you get that alarm going yeah. off and it's like... Because it's the wrong answer. No, Tim Berners-Lee did not invent the... Internet. Web 2.0? No. Interesting. He didn't do that and he didn't do that, but if you bring up the middle, you'll get there. Tim Berners-Lee invented what we know as the World Wide Web. In 1991, working in the CERN laboratory in Switzerland, Tim Berners-Lee took a lot of the protocols that existed on the internet, and if you like, mixed them all up and combined them, to create a new way of displaying and sharing information using the internet as a platform. Basically, he created the principles where you could construct a page that had media embedded in it, 
text embedded in it and could be found in a particular way. And he called this system the World Wide Web. It went that something which was actually not easy to use, and you had to have a lot of technological expertise to use the internet, he reduced the barriers down for using the internet as a communication tool to very, very little in effect. And the World Wide Web was incredibly successful. Berners-Lee made nothing from it because he gave away the code for free. Uh, as a uh, you know, government employee in the CERN uh, laboratory in Switzerland, he wasn't allowed to monetize his idea. If he had, he'd be the richest fucking guy in the world, to be fair, but he's not. But he is still an important guy. So when Tim Berners-Lee claims that the web is under threat from misinformation, questionable practices of political advertising and loss of control, and the weaponization of the web, we should listen to him because he made it. This is his thing. So he knows what he's talking about. What well, Berners-Lee, key argument is this idea of weaponization of the web by companies like Facebook. Facebook has transformed a service which was meant for public good and to improve communication, and which many, many companies have prospered across, many, many people have prospered across by using this platform. Berners-Lee argues that it has been weaponized. And the weapon is turned on us. The key thing to understand here is that weaponization of the web is against us. What does he mean by weaponization? The use of data harvested and analyzed by, other, by Facebook and others and then deployed as tools for political gain, such as the Cambridge Analytica data breach in 2015, which had effect upon the 2016 American election and the 2016 Brexit referendum, amongst many others globally. Um, how does this work? Well, the algorithms that work on Facebook troll through interactions and activities of users on the platform to gather sensitive personal information by sexual orientation, race, gender, intelligence, and even childhood trauma. And you think, whoa, and it's like, yes. That is all part of that data profile. We call this the mining and refining of the digital oil of the digital economy. We, in, in the sort of pre-digital economy, oil was the key commodity in that. Without oil, nothing worked. In petrol, stuff from manufacturing, engineering, etc., oil was the key thing. In the digital economy, the oil is our data. It is us. It is our activity, and it is how that is refined which is so important. Once you refine, those results can be used to target users with tailored information that play on the psychological and personal profile in order to get you to take a particular course of action. Again, we have an image of how these companies work. You all roughly know how this works, right? But you kind of think it's benign. You know, they get all this stuff that I put into my profile or the things I do on Instagram, and then it just goes out, you know, and, and then companies will buy it, and they'll advertise things to me, and I can either choose to buy something or not choose to buy something. It's all a really benign set of interactions. It's not benign. The purpose of refining that information is to exploit psychological weaknesses in every individual on those platforms in order to get you to do things. So if you think of those political campaigns, I'll give you a brilliant one from the Brexit referendum. A couple of days before the Brexit referendum, a huge number of people were targeted with very specific information about the European Union on animal welfare. Why? I will say it first as well that the information was wrong. The argument in that information was that the European Union were going to weaken animal welfare legislation. There's no indication that that was ever going to happen. It hasn't happened since in the seven years intervening. Why would they do that? So what? But yet, yeah, of course, Matt. Yeah, hundred percent. But why animal welfare? I know somebody was attacked kind of by this. They were vegetarian and then they saw this and then that's why they, they are 
so that information to that person who's a vegetarian and therefore like most vegetarians I would argue feels very strongly about animal welfare and um, you know and you know the way that animals are treated in society what I'm getting at here is they targeted emotion yeah. it wasn't that they were targeting people just scatter gun in order to get people to do it so oh, we, don't, we, we can go after vegetarians why do you go after vegetarians because it's an emotive issue you are much more likely to persuade somebody to, to take a course of action if you can emotionally engage them. So you target things like, okay, the big obvious ones in the Brexit campaign were like, if we stay in the European Union, Turkey will become part of the European Union, then 76 million Turkish people can go anywhere. Near. Well, Turkey's not in the European Union. It doesn't look like it's ever going to be in the European Union either. See, so but there's your racists, okay? They're happy. There are more subtle ways of doing this. If you've got a bunch of people wavering on an issue which is razor thin, and then you put something like that out, not based in any truth, all of a sudden you've got a few thousand. Well, do you know what? When margins are razor thin, a few thousand is important. And if you can get enough few thousands of people, that can add up to a significant number of people. Targeting people specifically on content and connections that they have with regards to animal welfare, you know, different organizations like PETA, you know, etc. Look, it's perfect. It's emotional manipulation. It's what governments and militaries call PSYOPs, psychological operations. You actually manipulate people on a military scale to get them to do things. This is what Tim Berners-Lee means by weaponization. You turn the very architecture of the communication system into a way to manipulate people into doing things. This was not his intention when he created this system. At the root of why Berners-Lee thinks this is a problem is because that the internet as a whole has become very, very polarized. Whereas when Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web, you had millions and millions of websites and millions and millions of companies and very little dominance of that platform by anything. Now you have dominant entities like Amazon, like Facebook, like, you know, I could go on and on, but you know who the big players are, Google. So Jan Lanier argues that the whole thing has become very consolidated. It's not a wilderness anymore. There are monopolies which exist, and those monopolies exist to make money. These companies are not benign. These companies exist to make as much money as possible, because guess what? That's what companies do. Yeah. Here's Jaron Lanier playing a weird fucking instrument. I wrote the biography of John Lanier. He's a really interesting guy. Um, so, for Lanier, the implication economy that we are currently building does not embrace capitalism as a system of participation. We are not a part of it. We're not in it. But it's a new form of feudalism where users are farmed for data, and he does use the term farmed. We are the cattle in this feudal system and their interactions with one another become the foundation of the data economy itself. What we do becomes the data economy. So I probably, I probably didn't do this actually because I didn't teach you guys MS100 last year. I don't know if Chris talked about this idea when he was talking about audiences of the audience commodity. I can't remember anyway, so I may as well be making shit up at this stage. Back in the 70s, an uh, American uh, theorist called Dallas Smythe came up with an idea called the audience commodity. It was the idea that we as an audience in the broadcast media age sat and watched television, yeah, or read a newspaper, or listened to the radio, and when we were doing that, we were doing work. We are doing unpaid labour for those television companies or radio networks or newspapers which allowed our work to be sold. So they had advertisers, they would say, these are the people who roughly watch our television programme. So they're sitting at home, what can we sell you, sell them for? And the advertiser, you know, the company would say, well, we'll buy a slot, yeah, we'll pay you this for it. 
So basically, we were doing work which has been sold. So the audience commodity as an idea has existed long before the digital economy has existed. Um, what are we buying now? Attention. Back in the day, that attention was being sold, but now we are selling it in a way that can be quantified exactly. Because Meta as a company can measure how long you look at something, how long you stop and you're scrolling in order to do this. So it's very close and specific what they can generate about your practices and how you do things. So the audience is a commodity. When Dallas Smythe was writing, he was talking about the audience, right, this big thing. Really, we're talking about the user as a commodity here. It's become individual. What you do is different than what I do. Different than what Lily does, right? They will know those differences between us because they've got very detailed information about each of us. So it's not the case that, you know, we're all roughly kind of the same, like, you know, probably the same kind of backgrounds and so on. So we're just going to chuck this thing out there and hope it sticks. Now we can actually get into the nuts and bolts of it. So, the basic infrastructure allows for all those things to happen. Every click. Every search, every like, every message, all of that, because it is on a closed platform, can be measured, can be quantified. So not only on the one hand do you have somebody who's selling a product saying, how many people clicked on that link? And you can go, yeah, here it is. But also you can tell them who they were. What kind of other interests do they have? And then you can flip it right back and like, Leighton Evans, what is he as a unit of economic value? How many times does he click on these links? And they look at him and say, he's done it four times in the last year. And he's done this, and he's done that, and he's done that. And you can say, yeah. Leighton Evans is a bit of a waste of oxygen, really, isn't he? But, you know, nevertheless, I'm making some kind of value for that company. Right? So, everything that happens, every user interaction can be measured. Every instance, every non-interaction when you're using the platform can be measured. They're measuring what you don't click on, what you scroll straight through. They're capturing that information to improve the experience next time. And by improve the experience, they mean you interact more. That's what improvement actually means in this context. When something is this evil, I've got to respect it. That's the thing, because I'm a big fan of evil, right? And, you know, this is bad. I hope everyone in the room is getting an indication of, holy shit, this is bad. It is bad, but you kind of got to take your hat off to it and say, that, you're bad on a big scale. Like, you know, you're not, you're not like Leighton Bad who goes into Tesco and steals a Kit Kat. Right? You're like, you know, you're proper bad, you know, you, you, you've got the skins of people drying in your attic bad, you know, you're Leighton's amateur, you know, you know, me nah, you nah, that's the scale we're talking about, right? So, <laughs> dominance of Facebook is through its dominance of the advertising platform. So basically, really since um, Tira Terranova wrote her book in 2004. We've been encouraged to think of Web 2.0 as a giant exploitation model. That, you know, we as, a, we as people are encouraged to contribute over the internet, to communicate with one another, and then that information is kind of harvested up and sold on. So Google were really important in the start of this. What people are now talking about more, though, I think, is this kind of idea, which kind of originates with Gert Loving, but I think Kylie Jarrett, is you know, old friend of mine is really really important in this, and Kylie's work she positions us as what we call what she calls the digital housewife. Now traditionally, in terms of labour relations, the housewife stayed at home, did all the domestic tasks, but wasn't rewarded for those tasks in terms of money, right? Because those tasks weren't seen as being economically valuable, even though 
it was Labour being involved in doing all these tasks, all right? so it's a really inequitable system. Kylie uses that analogy to describe us as users of social media, basically, and of all digital media. We are digital housewives. We're doing all the work, we're doing all the stuff, we're making all the value, we're making all the content, and we get nothing for it. So just like you know, the slob husband who you know, came back to the clean house and the cooked dinner and all that stuff, so he's getting all the value of what was going on in that labour, but not paying anything for it. Facebook is the slob husband, and we are the underappreciated, hard-working housewife. Yeah? So I think Kylie's analogy is a really, really neat one for that. Digital oil is you. You are the digital oil. And if you're data rich, if you have enough digital oil in your system, you're cash rich. The lesson of the digital economy is the more people you have in it, in your systems, and the more information they produce, the wealthier you are as a company. That is the one takeaway we can have over the last 20 years of this economy is the more people who do it, the better. And which is, this is why those monopoly positions are so valuable. If everyone buys on Amazon, Amazon isn't just rich because you buy stuff off them. They're rich because they have that data, vast amounts of data. Google is rich because who in this room uses a different search engine to Google? Exactly. Have you ever tried to use Bing? Do you use Bing? <laughs> I'm afraid you've this one. <laughs> I mean, it does the same job, right? It's fine. But, it's like, but I don't use Bing. It's, a, it's just a stupid name, Bing. What the fuck? Like? Uh, you know, I Google stuff. It's a verb. I want to, I want to go to search for something. Yeah, I'm going to Google that. It's like, why am I using the company name as a verb? Right? Because it, it perfectly describes that activity, right? That's how fundamental it is. That's a monopoly position right there. So, if they're in a monopoly position, and you know, 90 odd percent of all search traffic goes through Google, that is as close to a monopoly position as you ever want to get, basically, because they've got huge amounts of value. Everything that we search for goes on that. Even the weird stuff we search for. And I, I get in these wiki wormholes all the time. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you go for something on Wikipedia and then you click on all these links and you, all of a sudden you're reading about. You know, how they used to extract teeth in Indonesia in the 1700s. And you think, this is amazing. You know? and, and then I will go to Google and search for people on it. So my search history must be really odd. It's like, well, he's into this, and he's into this, and he's into... It's all over the place. Still value. That, that's the point. Yeah, it doesn't matter what I search for. The fact that I'm doing it is the important thing. So, The key term I want you to get into your head is that Facebook makes data subjects. The great French theorist Michel Foucault used to write about how bureaucracies in society would create subjects. Basically said that the state worked in particular ways to make us into what it wanted us to be. So through the education system, through the health system, through all these giant infrastructures and bureaucracies that existed in everyday society, it would produce the kind of desirable citizens that you wanted in a particular state. Manageable, pliable, not like you kick off every five minutes, you know, this kind of thing, right? So Foucault was really into this notion that like, the state and the, you know, its appendages, for want of a better word, it's not a great word, unfortunately, um, they created a particular kind of subject. Now, today, we need to consider what kind of subject is created by these networks, by these companies. Because they are in the business in two senses of creating data subjects. One, they're creating a little object. Alice is being made as a data subject right now. And you're being continually made and remade as your interactions are shaping things. And then that little data object is being sold to advertisers, right? but at a much higher level of abstraction, we're being made. Our nature, what we do, how we think, what we think about things, how we talk about things, who we relate to, what we stand in relation to, 
all of those things are being shaped by our interactions with these services as well. So we're being made a subject also. Because when something is infrastructural in this way, it has a much, much bigger effect than just saying, well, we make this little thing out of you. Well, you're making us as well. And this is really the fundamental thing that I want you to think about in your projects, right? How has Instagram made you? That's really what you're talking about, Alice, in your project. How has Instagram made me? You're doing it in a really specific way. But the real answer that you're going to come up with is over that decade, of, probably not quite a decade, but those many years of using Instagram, it's shaped you, right? You know, my usage of Facebook, I've had a Facebook account for 16 years. That's a long time. My longest relationship is four years. <laughs> so, you know, I've had a relationship with Facebook four times as long as I've ever had a relationship with a woman. Given my relationship history, that's not a shock, but it, but it does tell us something really important about how stable these things are in our lives, right? I've had a Twitter account for 13 years. Holy crap, you know? That's a long time. Actually, no longer. 14 years? Holy shit. What happened to my life? Um, you know, and etc. etc. We, we have long-standing things, but your use of these is shaping us as well. On the company side, that data subject is constructed as soon as you start using. Now, I want to substitute out this idea that you have to have an account. Because, in fact, that's being made before you even start using digital technology as well. When your parents post information, I, can, I know I'm talking in abstract here, you guys didn't have this, right? But when parents post information about their child on Facebook and a lovely little baby photo, you've just made a data subject. <laughs> they know the kid's name, date of birth, weight at birth, what it looks like, who the parents are, and who likes those <laughs> images as well. It's already constructed a network around those people. You already made it. You made it for them. So why are we saying like, you know, if you're really worried about your kid's privacy and things like that, Literally, don't do anything. Don't post anything about them. But people can't do that because it doesn't mean, you know, you don't, you're not a baby unless you do the baby focus thing, right? You, you've got to show the baby on Instagram, you know? What's wrong with this? I was going to do this on Neopop, but let's just throw it open. What the heck? Why am I getting so animated about this? What is fundamentally wrong with what these companies are doing, if anything? Change our behavior. Changing your behavior. Okay. Maybe that's wrong. Now, I grew up in an age where smoking was more acceptable. Okay? But all the way through my youth and through my adulthood, I've been subject to a lot of information about the dangers of cigarette smoke. Yeah? I'm fully aware of what the dangers are. If I was to go and buy a packet of cigarettes now from the shop, I would have a visual illustration of some one kind of danger that there is, like, you know, a really crudded up lung, or that dude's got no teeth, or, you know, or whatever it is, right? dead person, whatever. So, that is an attempt by the state to make me do something. Because I smoked cigarettes, like, I started smoking when I was, like, 16, and I gave up. I've given up loads of times, <laughs> but I, I haven't smoked now for what, six months, something like that. Okay? That's one of the longest times I've been. Was it wrong to change my behaviour? It's neutral. Like, but this, in this case, it was good, but it could be used in. Yeah. I guess it's the way in yeah. which our behaviour yeah. changed which is important in that context. We have to question how they're doing that. Now, the purpose of that question on the board is this. I want to move on because I've still got things to cover. It's bad because we're not involved. We don't have a say in these things. So when there's, there's things going on about behavioural change, we're not a contributor to that. We're out of it. You sign up for Instagram, and I can assure you of this, I can show you, in fact, the two things here. One, none of you read the terms and conditions. 
right? But you never do. It's fine, neither do I. If you did read the terms and conditions, they'd be virtually un non applicable anyway. You need a fucking advanced degree in law to understand those the terms and conditions and these things anyway. Two, there was nothing in the terms and conditions about making you into a data subject. That's not something you signed up to. But it happened before you even signed up. This is happening without our consent, is the point I'm making. Now, when you sign the terms and conditions for something like Instagram, you do consent for your data to be shared with select, you know, the language is fascinating these things, with select partners of Meta as a company. They will have changed the terms and conditions now from Instagram or Facebook to Meta. But you don't consent to your life being scraped apart to construct a profile of you which exploits your psychological vulnerabilities in order to force you to do things against your will. That's not in the terms and conditions, I can assure you. If it was, you'd know about it and you probably wouldn't press OK. Yeah? So, the problem with all of this is these things are being decided without us as part of that process. That, in a democratic society, isn't really something we want to be doing. So, Evgeny Morozov has done a lot of work about this over the years, fascinating um, character. Optimism about social media is based on techno-deterministic ideologies of cyber-utopianism. What a fucking sentence that is. The only postulate advantages for businesses and society through the lens of that industry. What Morozov is saying here is that any benefits of social media only come from the benefits that it creates for the companies that operate social media. All the benefits of it. So what, what does Facebook classically say? When, when Zuckerberg does his yearly spiel thing, he's always saying, we're making it easier for people around the world to connect. That's a classic Zuckerberg line, right? What does that mean? We're making it easier for people around the world to generate data interactions with one another so we can harvest that information for profit. What Zuckerberg says, you can always translate into the language of Facebook as a company because that's all he ever says. He never says anything else. I'll give him this, he's honest at least. His language tries to hide it a bit, but basically it all boils down to the one thing. I think Rushkoff's point about this was written in 2010, a long time ago. Social media is involved in the process of optimizing humans for machinery. What he means by that is we are being optimized to be machinery. Social media optimizes our behavior, our interactions, and the way that we function with the world to make us more machine-like. A machine is a system that exists to do something in an optimal, efficient manner. Social media makes us more efficient at communicating, expressing emotion, sharing information, which means we are optimized for that machine. Social media is a machine. I really like it. Can we connect this idea to the, even the detoxing part that you mentioned? You know, last week or two weeks ago. That you can, yeah. So we're leaving social media, we're still being optimized. Of course, yeah. yeah. You're leaving social media and you're being you optimized in a different way, yeah. yeah. Christian Fuchs is a really important guy. Uh, the Fuchs' book is in that reading folder I told, told you about before the break. Um, it's actually in the third edition now. And what Fuchs does in, this is from the first edition, but it's been updated since. I recommend if you're going to discuss this, particularly in the reflective essay, you go to Christian Fuchs's book and have a look to see what he says about this. It is absolutely spot on. I have done a lot of that work for you in this slide. Okay, it's even page referenced for you, so you know you can just pick up and drop this. Fuchs argues that Facebook is a company controlled by private shareholders who own that platform. So when we create profit which without us there would be none, we don't own that profit. We are exploited. 
Whenever we do things which generate value for the company involved, we are exploited because we do not own any of that company. It is a point I've made several times in this module. It is fundamentally dangerous way to do business. You are feudalizing individuals. And at the same time as exploiting us, we are doubly exploited because the same platform then uses us as consumers for other things that are being sold by the company's consumers. So on the one hand, everything we do is exploited. It's harvested away in order to construct this image of us and to realize value through our data. And then they've got the cheek afterwards to put an advert next to it. It's like, this is bad, you know? It's like, we're gonna fundamentally exploit you, Lily, and we're gonna sell you something at the same time. Holy shit, like, you know, this is terrible. Of course, this functioning also means that Facebook and other platforms are giant surveillance platforms at the same time. They are hoovering up every bit of information they can about us, watching us at all times. Did you know, for example, that your location services are on, on your phone at all times if you have Facebook, the app installed, or Instagram? You might ask yourself, why? Would Instagram want to know where I am? Well, location data is one of the most important fundamental bits of data that you can have in terms of advertising. Because if you know where a person spends a lot of their time and you have a pattern of that over time, you can advertise hyperlocal services to them. It is the holy grail. You know where they stand in relation to other businesses around them. It is literally the holy grail of advertising that. If you know what people do at particular times of the day and where they're going to be, bull fucking zai. You know why they're, where they're going to be at that point in time. You know what's around them, and you know what they like. Let's go make some money. Easy peasy. This is like shooting fish in a barrel at this point. <laughs> the privacy of individuals and the right to privacy has been completely eradicated in this age. Our very concept of privacy itself has gone. This is a surveillance society. The fundamental operating system of society is a surveillance system designed to know where you are at all times and who you are with at all times. You might think, well, how do they know that? Well, guess what? The person next to you has the same thing going on in their pocket too. <laughs> we all do. So, for privacy, we have seen the collapse of privacy. Privacy no longer exists. Distinction between, this is Hannah Arendt, the distinction between the private and public realms equals the distinction between things that should be shown and things that should not be hidden, according to Arendt. Arendt's distinction between two distinct parts of society, the private and the public, has gone. They have been collapsed together. Those things in private, things that shouldn't be shown, our, our private lives, the lives that we can lead outside of the glare of everyone else, that's gone. Because these companies harvest everything about that space. There is always somebody who is quantifying the private. When Arend was talking about the difference between public and private, she meant it was a space away from exploitation away from commercialization. It doesn't any longer exist. Now, Arendt was aware, you know, television, etc. back in the broadcast media era, they had interruptive influences on the private sphere. What she'd make of this, I don't know. She, she must be spinning in her grave. Because it is gone. What she did, you know, because Facebook monitors, commodifies, and uses all private data and user behavior. Everything. Your private, most innermost thoughts. Because you do action those. You search for stuff. You know, you look up stuff online, you read about something online. You worry, you know. Facebook knew I was diagnosed with ADHD before I did. Why? Because I was looking up stuff about it, of course. Trying to understand as much of that as possible. It's hoovered all that information up. 
It knew before I did. One of the weirdest things about the digital oil is this, right? When the first services started about digital, when we first started thinking about digital oil in the mid-2000s, does anyone hear about Tesco Club Card? A few people, good. So they started in the 90s, Tesco Club Cards. It's a relatively benign service. Again, you, you do your shop and you give them the club card and over time you can get like, some vouchers. Right? And it wasn't until the early 2000s when they started digging through all this massive trove of information they collected since the 1990s, Tesco started to realize they could do predictions of things. For example, Tesco started to realize that they could predict uh, women getting pregnant before they got pregnant. <laughs> yeah, no. If somebody is trying to get pregnant, they will often take a certain set of supplements, things like folic acid and stuff like that, which improve the chances of pregnancy happening, basically, you know, improve the window for fertility for a woman in that period of time. Tesco, when they started engineering through their data, which they collect over a long period of time, started to see patterns of behavior because from those buying patterns, they could see like nine months later, those people were buying baby food. <laughs> you know, I was just saying, okay, so they did that, and then they got there, okay. Well, start marketing. <laughs> but basically, then they started running experiments in real time about like, you know, who is buying this stuff. It was always women of a certain age profile, you know, and so on and so forth. So basically, they stumbled upon a way of anticipating when somebody was going to be pregnant. That's powerful. It's kind of creepy, right? That's private. Right, that would be a kind of definition. I know people might talk about that to other people, but that, that is something which should be outside of the realm of com commercialization, really. Not in this day and age. Those kind of things no longer exist in the private. That is really the point we make about privacy. So, this is what Facebook is. Huge advertising, capital accumulation, and data exploitation machine. Data surveillance is the means for that economic model. I'm going to skip through some of these things because we don't need to know them. And you can come back to them. But I do want to talk about this because it's really important. So a lot more context in the slides that I've skipped through. Use it if you want to use it for your essays or for your projects, okay? It just gives you extra context to use. Lots of references in there that you can just pull up. This is something that you all need to be aware of. It's called A-B testing. Now, somewhere out there, Jem, you have a digital twin. Somebody has matched up to you, say on Instagram, they have matched you to somebody that shares similar characteristics, etc., et similar backgrounds. So. so Jem has a digital tin. You've probably never met your digital tin, you probably never will, but they're there, okay? Facebook as a company does experiments with your digital twin. It's called A-B testing. It will pair you up with individuals that you have never met but share certain characteristics with, and then will vary how it presents information to you. And it does this for the basis of refining interaction. So, Jem gets the depressing crap. Okay? Her digital twin gets the nice version. You know, the positive stories. Jem gets all the bad stories. And then they measure, well, 